Welcome to the Tom Nelson Podcast. I have Terry Gannon here. And Terry, could you tell us a little bit about yourself to get us started? Yeah, I've, I've been a, a, an advocate, an activist in, in the climate skeptical science arena for 10 or 15 years. My background is in device physics and semiconductors, which is probably better than most climate scientists get that I've run into um, because it spans from quantum mechanics to computer modeling to optical systems, complex systems, and, you know, problem solving. Uh, in other words, figuring out what's important. And so this is, this is a very good background. It's proved to be a very good background for me to have to, to learn from some of the great teachers who are actually listed in your list of people that, uh, you know, like, uh, Willie Sam and Will Hepper and Ronan Connolly and Michael Connolly. So these are, these are my great teachers. And, and I think what, what I'd like to, to cover today is the climate discussion. Um, what have we seen to date in the climate discussion and, uh, have, have the topics been covered sufficiently? And the answer is no. And there's a very specific reason which we'll get into and we'll cover some of the topics and challenge the, the audience to, to read. So really, you know, this is a conversation on climate and I love this picture of a cloud because, you know, part of, uh, part of the energy release of earth from earth into the atmosphere is the water vapor and the formation of clouds. And if you can imagine, if you can imagine having developing a computer model to, you know, essentially describe what energy, how this energy is being released from the earth's surface, it, you know, more power to that person. But this is, this is so often the case. Earth fights very hard to get the energy uh, balance achieved, which means energy in equals energy out. And we'll cover that in some some detail and look at different, you know, atoms and so on and so forth. But the general flow of the, of the presentation is where are we in climate science and how did we get here? And I don't think that, uh, most people have heard any sort of words. I'm, I'm talking general public, any sort of general words about, um, uh, you know, about climate skeptical science. And I gave a presentation of which this is partly borrowing from to a group of people that really were very interested, but didn't really know, have any background. And that's the video that you saw of Tom and, and, you know, that was interesting yeah. because the group, you know, uh, really had no, ba no background, but they were very interested in, in finding out more. And I think that was a, a great starting point, but what are we being given in, in, in scientific arguments? And. I think this is a good time to bring up one of the things that I see that is culturally happening in our society. And that is that a lot of things, if you look at a newspaper or a daily newspaper, what you begin to realize is that we're in a, we're not in a uh, root cause analysis culture. We're in a, a declaration culture. And what I mean by that, and we'll come to that in a second in more detail, is that, you know, you end up declaring something to be true and you may have no scientific scientific basis for it. And, you know, people can call you names and they can do various things that are declarative. And, uh, these have great meaning in our, in our current culture. So we have to, we have to be very much aware of how this is affecting science. And we'll talk about that in, in general terms. Um, but I think also I'll touch on very quickly in the time we get on where are we headed with, with climate science? What, what is the, what are the policies that are, are being considered? And what can we do as citizens to, to really in, in the general public to really, um, you know, function and raise the right questions and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it is, it's a, it's a very interesting society and a culture we live in, in that, you know, what we're seeing is that, uh, the cancel culture and in the culture wars are, have taken great root in a lot of institutions. We'll talk about that as well. So, you know, the introduction as I retired, people have asked me, where are you in life? And I said, well, actually people, some people call it being retired, but I consider it that I gave myself a promotion. So I'm a core value engineer and, you know, I have a sense of purpose in life to, to help kids, to help people understand, to pass on, you know, my, um, 
my sort of learning and my knowledge in the form of Socratic learning opportunities for other people. And I think that, you know, one of the things that you rarely see, and, and you know, you see a lot of issues, we see a, a tremendous number of issues and they tend to repeat themselves. They'll come up one year and they'll come back the next year. And, uh, you know, I look at root causes and I think that's because of my engineering background. You know, I see an issue and I say, well, do I understand the root cause of that? And we'll get into that in terms of climate science as well. And, you know, I think root causes really are, are very straightforward to understand why. And I think that's, that's a, an important backdrop to this whole entire presentation. And science, the attack we are, we are seeing is, is hitting a variety of ways in higher education. If you look at MIT today, you look at Harvard today, you look at the last 16 years at Harvey Mudd, a very, you know, um, renowned and very esteemed STEM college that I grew up, you know, revering. And you see where they are today. I mean, Harvard just announced a new president that, who is pretty much exclusively not worried about STEM, but more worried about social justice. And MIT is going through some rather dramatic changes. And I've gotten very close to some of the people trying to work on that issue. And, you know, I think the other thing that I've gotten involved in, in addition to climate and renewables and net zero and all the things we'll talk about later, is, you know, what is happening to reform or can be done to reform higher education, which is a very important part of our, our society. The science, science being attacked as it is today is, is very much a factor in, in uh, you know, what is, uh, what is being done. The thing that, that really gives it away, uh, you know, the current condition and discussion on climate science is that there's no debate. And I think, you know, the Einstein quote of all I need is one engineer, just one engineer to prove me wrong. That's all I need. I don't need, I don't need consensus. As Michael Crichton said, science is not about consensus. So debate is missing. You cannot ask for a debate. Most people uh, have not had or seen a debate and the science is settled. If I get up in front of an audience, I say, is the science about healthcare so? If any complex system comes along and it looks like it is important to uh, society, do we declare it somehow that the science on that issue is settled or do we always keep studying it? Most of the time people say, well, we should keep studying it, of course. But in the area of climate, we don't seem to have that perspective. So the attack on institutions is real. Um, ESG is about attacking the investment communities. Woke Inc. is about you know, putting, installing group think into corporations. And that's very much in play in climate science as well. And definitely in higher ed, higher ed is seeing very strong, uh, emphasis on that, uh, group think, and we'll come to more specifics in a second, but you know, the, the whole idea that you would not have critical thinking as your objective, teaching people how, how to think critically in higher education, uh, where, which is what I received when I went through higher ed, went through a PhD program, um, is just, is foreign. It makes no sense to most people of my age or my age category. The spearhead for the attack on science, the real tip of the spear is climate science. Climate science was attacked first and that occurred 30 years ago. And I think many people may recall or may have seen Jay Bhattacharya, who is a very genuine person. He's in immunology and a lot of healthcare science. And, uh, I've gotten, I've gotten, I haven't gotten to know him, but I've met him several times. And I commented to him at, at an academic freedom conference recently, we were sitting next to each other. And I said, Jay, you know what you have to realize. And he gave a very impassioned speech on, you know, what he has experienced him being censored and he, he couldn't understand it. And I said, well. Jay, I've got, I've got something for you to think about because what you're experiencing now was experiencing climate science 30 years ago. So the control of the energy industry is the clear goal. Then we'll cover that in more detail, but that's a, you, you, you control the energy industry, you control the economy, you control the economy of the U S you can control the world. Well, this has really ominous tolerance associated with it. 
And the money flow difference is, is huge in all categories. And I'll try to point that out. If we had more money to study some, some of these things, we'd be much better off as a society, but we don't. It's, it's, uh, it's a rather dramatic difference. And I think one of the, one of the great uh, humor is that it, it, uh, you know, the response to the paper submitted by a skeptic is as shown, you know, you get thrown over the fence. And Willie Santa has chronicled all his experiences to me, and you know, many people have. And yet, you can get published. Uh, you know, Barack Obama can get published on, in Nature magazine, no problem. So there's there's no peer review. It, it really becomes more of a power review, uh, a biased review, and whatnot. But you know, the important thing to keep in mind is that this is billions, and I'm talking many billions. We don't know how much. Um, you know, the, the amount of campaigning for, for climate change and all the policies that, that you, everybody sees, there's declarations every single week, but, oh my God, there's another extreme weather event. You'll see we extreme weather events during the weather season. And then we'll come back to other types of declarations, again, yeah. declarations in a few months when we get into the springtime. And, and so on and so forth. And so we'll touch on that. We won't cover extreme weather events in this presentation, but you know, there's a lot of really good material out there that, that I can point people to. But the billions, uh, you know, in, you know, there's many foundations and I'm in Silicon Valley. So there's the Hewlett Foundation, you know, you've got foundation on top of foundation on top of foundation, and they probably have, they spend you know, $100 million just in getting together and saluting themselves, you know, as foundations. But, you know, we're talking about people that are working in skeptical science who get by on, on, on just a few millions. It, the ratio is significant. And I think some of the quotes that I've gathered along the, top, along the years, and this goes, covers several years, but these are some of the highlights. Trentworth, who is a high-ranking official in the IPCC, made the comment, and I'm quoting him almost exactly. He said, if the data does not agree with the models, the data is wrong. Now this is, this is, this brings Feynman back from his grave. Okay, this is, this is really bad science. You know, you're saying that the data is subject to the computer models, and we're gonna go into the computer models in, in enough detail that you can make your own opinion. People can, can, you know, look at this and study it in however you wish. I, I got a PhD in, in, uh, effectively with a heavy dose of computer modeling in semiconductors. So, you know, it is, it is definitely, um, you know, without the computer models, we don't have global warming is, is really part of it. But while the science may not be great, another quote, shouldn't we do something anyway? And this is the precautionary principle. And you'll see this showing up in political arenas. Well, we don't know exactly what's going to happen here, but we should step in and, you know, we should fight for Ukraine and we should do all these things and, you know, just because we should, and we just need to do something and we'll throw a gazillion dollars at it and hope that that sticks somehow. And so that's, that's the precautionary principle. And another one, Marie Strong, this is a very powerful one because Marie Strong was back in the seventies. And he, he was, in effect, really one of the leaders in the early organization formation of the IPCC. It had a different name then. I think it was FCCC or something before they really formed it as an IPCC and started publishing reports. And so he, and, he was a good, a good associate of, you would guess, probably accurately, George Soros. And then Maurice got, you know, got swept up in this and he wasn't a scientist at all. So, but he got swept up in it and he made the point. We may get to the point where the only way of saving the world will be for the industrial civilization to collapse. And he said, we have to destroy industrialized countries. He said, that may be our duty. We all, you know, with that little doubt in his voice, but basically he's laying the stage. Maurice went on to be, uh, basically convicted of a crime. He fled and, and ended up uh, going to China where he died effectively. But a good friend of George Soros, an associate of George Soros. And then another one that's probably along the way I captured 
science is settled. The consensus among scientists is real. And, you know, a lot of the uh, people that are in your podcast list, uh, mm -hmm. Willie Soon, I think David Gates is in there. Yeah, you know, yeah. Some of the other people, Conley's are probably in there, have proven that statement to be exactly wrong. And, you know, that they went back through all of the papers to find out which scientists really believed that man's emissions led to dangerous conditions as far as future climate. And that, that number turned out to be less than 3%. So, you know, it's, it, you get the idea that there's a fictional basis historically. So science, what, what is good science? Well, you start with assumptions, you test the assumptions, you bring in hypotheses as to why the you know, results are what they are. You know, they develop theories that, you know, kind of stand up against scrutiny and people look at them and they, and, you know, they, they, they debate them and so on and so forth. The reviews occur until proven wrong or until knowledge is gained. And then they're always subject to being tested. They're not, people can't lose their job if they raise a question about a scientific, you know, fact, because people understand that that's how you gain knowledge. That's how you gain progress as a society. You say, well, you know, I've got, I've got, um, you know, this idea. And I know that healthcare didn't really solve, doesn't know how to solve the question about how to kill a tumor in your brain. But, you know, I kind of know how to solve that problem. And so they go off and they solve that problem. They come back. This is a true story of a Stanford grad. And, and he came up with a system that allowed the targeting of radiation into the brain, but targeting the radiation not through the same path through the brain, because then you'd be killing that what's on that path on the brain. So you could, you know, you could pinpoint in the brain that you'd be able to rotate the path without, without killing the path. And it's an, it's an instrument called a cyber knife. And, and that cyber knife was used on me and killed two brain towers in my brain. So I, I bow to good science and people running away with hypotheses and, and realizing them. And you see Silicon Valley is full of people like that if they can only defend what they do. But, you know, the alternative is that, you know, peer review papers are losing their meaning. You know, there's so much lack of reproducibility in the humanities and so on and so forth. Science, science uh, is losing, the greater field of science is losing merit and quality. And it starts with admission into higher education. And rather than understand the root cause of some of these, you know, some of these people not being able to get into um, you know, higher education because of bad inner city schools, excuse me, or, you know, some other cause and try to deal with the root cause. No, you just basically lower the standard and you force people to say what we need is equal outcomes. We don't need merit or meritocracy. We need equal outcomes. And you set up a an entire bureaucracy and spend countless millions, probably a hundred times more on DEI administrators throughout the higher ed than you actually spend on skeptical science. You get these, these, these dollars running through your mind when you analyze what's going on. Um, but you know, why is such a terrible outcome difference desired? I mean, why is, why is this happening? And the chronicles of critical theory, and I, I'm not going to go through this in any great detail, but cause it's really off, off the topic a bit. People need to understand a little bit about, again, the, the root cause. And if you go back through some of the literature that's available, you can scan these people, look at their videos on YouTube and so on and so forth. One of the, one of the ones that I think is more comprehensive um, and very much in, in detail, a hard book to read, I'll, I'll caution you, but you can see the videos, is by James Lindsay and it's called Critical Theory. And I think most people understand and have heard of critical race theory. And so critical race theory is that there, there is an inherent systematic bias by race and that, you know, we have to change the educational system accordingly. And we have to start, you know, uh, untraining the systematic bias. 
And I think James Lindsay goes back into the history of that. If you want to understand it, that's the way you can understand it. One that's more approachable uh, nowadays, uh, and I've seen him in all his videos and read the book, is The War on the West. And this is by a, a you know English journalist who's now living in, in America called Douglas Murray. And I don't know if you've heard of him, Thomas, but no. he... He is uh, the madness of crowds with his last book before this book. I, I highly recommend looking at the video. You can do various videos. There's a number of videos. He's very popular on the podcast circuit. And, you know, I saw him in this academic freedom conference and so on and so forth. It, he's really taking what James Lindsay put forth and said, you know, this is a war against the West. And, you know, I think that many people historically in uh going way back from the school in in some school in london you know they had a term that they borrowed from i think it was lenin the long march to the institutions and people will begin to see how that applies when you see how the institutions are gradually being taken over by this ideology and then the one that's very recent the book that's very recent is by vivek Ramaswamy who's a brilliant person, just absolutely brilliant. He's probably in his mid thirties and you think he's probably a scholar in his mid sixties or something, but the guy is just brilliant. Yeah. He's, in, he's got an investment background. He started a startup company in, in microbiology and he, he's gone back through the nation of victims. And, and really what he's saying is we have a choice to make. We have to make it soon, meaning not 50 years from now that you either seek excellence or you seek victimhood. And he points out all the instances where people are seeking victimhood. It's not hard to find in today's world. But so this is the backdrop as to why we are where we're at from an ideological point of view. And so let's, let's move on into declarations and then we'll get down into some of the science. Um, declarations are, you know, in many ways, the insertion of unverified facts to support a supposition that there is an overriding narrative reinforcing that there is danger ahead. That's a long way of saying, you know, you make up root cause and you proceed to, you know, create a narrative that's overpowering and you punish people if they don't abide by the narrative. And if they ask questions about the narrative, you fire them. So, you know, there's, there's a, there's definitely a totalitarian nature to this. The, the basic approach is the reliance on selected experts. And of course, the experts aren't, you know, typically aren't experts at all. I'll list Michael Mann and Gavin Schmidt and a few others, Trent Kenperth as examples. These are not experts at all. They, they, they have an incredibly narrow background. And I think what's interesting about the skeptical scientists that I have met, Willie's a perfect example of this, but, you know, Will Happer is as well. Um, and, you know, you had early on in your podcast, you had, uh, Richard Lenzen, who is really considered to be the godfather of skeptical, you know, climate science. And I, I give my hand off to him if he's viewing this far into my video. Skeptical scientists can talk to you about mercury poisoning. I'm really sort of looking at Welly now. They can talk to you about solar physics. They can talk to you about, you know, ocean physics. Um, they can talk to you about astrophysics. They can talk to you about, you know, the, uh, some of the computer modeling that's being done and they go on and on and on from there. In most climate scientists, uh, today's world, I really describe them as more bureaucratic spreadsheet experts because they're computing the total cost of, of CO2, social cost of CO2. And I think this, this, you know, kind of quote from, uh, Len, from, uh, Feynman really kind of summarizes. Science is a belief in the ignorance of experts. Question everything is the point. And, you know, Feynman is an MIT grad. He was very important at MIT. He wouldn't be probably even accepted into MIT in the current scenario because he's got the wrong skin color. So this is, this is definitely something of, of uh, you know, significance when you look at how revered he has been in science. So let's come to, let's come to earth and the climate. 
most people, you know, know this already, but I want to just kind of refresh people's minds a little bit that, you know, um, Earth is 72% covered by water. If you land on Earth today from, let's call it outer space, and, you know, I, I made up uh, this part of this talk was given, was planned to be given to a small group. And I, I was going to de define the group as being uh, foreign. Uh, you know, they were aliens from another planet called Birth. And Earth people came and they landed and they looked at this planet and they go, God, there's a lot of water here. You know, this must really have a big impact on the climate. It, oh my God, there's a lot of clouds here as well. So the surface velocity at the equator, most people don't even really think about this because they think, you know, Earth is stationary, right? I mean, that's what we, that's where we live. That's where we stand. I don't fall over very often, uh, but we're spinning it in, at a very high velocity at the, at the tropic level, at the level of the tropics. And, you know, we, because of gravity, we can stay put. The atmosphere stays put largely because of gravity as well. And the atmosphere weighs over 700 tons per capita. And I, I mentioned that, that statement in a group of scientists one time. And, and one guy who's more of, of an administrator, historically, I won't mention his name, but he looked at me and said, you, you've got to be kidding me. And I said, no, it's 700 tons per capita. And I, you know, when I raise that in various, uh, various discussions and I ask people, well, could you take a guess as to how much weight per capita the atmosphere, the entire atmosphere, gas atmosphere, uh, contains per capita? There's close to 8 billion people. So you can easily do the math. How many, how many pounds or tons or whatever is there? And you're usually saying something like, well, there's probably something like 50 pounds, right? So, you know, you get the, you get the measure. And this is really important. And this is very important to why the gas law that Michael Connolly talks about is in operation in the atmosphere, in a good part of the atmosphere. But also that the cloud cover can vary from 40% to 70%. Now, as you look at the clouds in this picture, it's pretty in indicative of what's going on. Uh, you know, what's happening here? Well, the white indicates that the energy from the sun is being reflected back from the surface, near the surface. And so, you know, you, you basically uh, are seeing the energy being reflected back, and we'll cover that in a second. By the way, you know, the one, one of the many things that the IPCC says they can't model accurately are the clouds. So, you know, you get a, you get a measure of, you know, that's, that's a huge statement. So the models don't work, right? Anyway, we'll cover that in more detail as we go. So the overview is, how energy flows, energy comes in and it goes out. Gas is in the atmosphere, spectrum of radiation, which is, I think it's important for most people to understand. And I'm partial to spectrum because there's a lot of quantum mechanics there. There's a lot of, you know, how CO2 is operating. And then the IPCC claims, and we'll cover that briskly, I would say. History of the Earth's climate is, is rather interesting and revealing. Climate models is also rather interesting and revealing. And then what are the benefits of CO2 to the earth? Is CO2 really the polluter that it's supposed to be in the conclusions? So you want to get, yeah. So you can see all the errors are pointing in various directions. And that's really kind of partly the result of the fact that the earth is spinning so fast. And then you have this progression. And the only thing I really want to say about this is energy flow here is because the equator is the hottest spot. It's where most sunlight is, is collecting on Earth's surface. It's, it's uh, trying to get rid of that, that uh, flow. And obviously, the flow is to the north and the south. And so it's to the polar caps. And so we're going to show you, we're actually going to show you a preview. We're going to show you how CO2 actually enhances the energy out of the polar caps. So that, you know, that's a Will Happer special. Um, the, this, this diagram is, again, uh, one that's used a lot. I want to touch on just a couple of points here. Yellow is the incoming. It does show, and this is a standard. I don't know where this came out of. It actually came out of Trentworth, so it's, it's out of the IPCC. And even though they show a slight curvature indicating that they're really trying to describe Earth, it's what 
is really more accurately described as a flat disk model. And the flat disk model is you normalize everything to a flat disk. And you can't do that. Why can't you do that? Because the Earth uh, radiation out, the Earth in terms of a lot of things, is a very nonlinear problem. And you can't linearize it arbitrarily. And yet, I think Will Hacker says, this is a cartoon that's in here. Will Hacker has got such a great sense of humor. But this kind of shows you, uh, you know, that the energy out has three different components from the Earth's surface. And one of them is radiation, which is the infrared radiation, which we're going to show in a minute. And another one is, is conduction and convection. Uh, conduction and convection are two different ones, actually. And those are actually conduction and convection together, even though they're not shown in the right scale, are the dominant ones. So, you know, again, you've got this rush. If you can think of, you know, the, the uh, energy going out as little human beings, they're climbing all over each other, trying to get off Earth and in back into outer space. And the other point I want to make here is that the energy in from the sun, which is you know, the vast, vast majority of the energy on Earth is from the sun. Well, that's radiation coming in. And you have to get the radiation going out that's equal to radiation in, or this, the Earth's surface temperature will adjust accordingly to make it equal. But one has to then borrow again. So if we move on into the absolute temperature, um, and you'll see other representations of temperature throughout this presentation. You'll see that in the U.S., which is really on the landmass of continental U.S., in degrees Fahrenheit, an absolute temperature. So if you're out, you know, you're going outside today and it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, that's an absolute temperature. And so you, you can look at this and you can see that the, the maximum temperature would be when it's, you know, the hottest of, in, the, in the daytime. And this is, you know, these are all monthly averages. If you look at each peak, it's a monthly average. So that's the orange. So that goes from zero to, you know, or 10 in the scale up, up to that level. And then the green is basically the average for the day. So it's average day and night. And the team in is, is obviously during probably the coldest time farthest from the sun's radiation. And so that's the blue, which kind of dips down below. Now, as you scan across this, you'll see that this is 1890 to close to current time, something like late 2010 decade. And if you scan across the top of, let's just do the max, you scan across the top, you know, the point to the, re the, the audience is, can you see a significant change in temperature? And you say, well, you know, I can't, I can see a couple of degrees Fahrenheit up and then back down again. I see that there's a peak in around the mid 1930s, which is a very hot period. I'll talk about more about that later. And then you kind of go into something that looks like it's a cooling period up to the seventies, which it was a cooling period and then so on and so forth up to current times. So when you look at the absolute temperature, you'd say, can you make a better case for global warming being a disaster because industrialization or the big increase in CO2 occur about the midline, about 1940s and 50s. And we'll have, we'll have a chart on that. And so, you know, you, you can indeed look at this and say, okay, industrialization to the right, largest amount of, you know, impact on total CO2 to the right. And, you know, before man's really influence on anything in the total CO2 way to the left. And I don't see a big difference. Can you, can you guys, high paid climate scientists, tell me what's going on here? And so that would be a perfectly valid question to ask. Well, you'd be fired from your job if you asked it. But so, you know, that, that is, is something that's, that's very much in play here. Now, as we get into the atmosphere, what is going on is I just look at what is the, the official list of components in the atmosphere. You see that nitrogen and oxygen are 98%. And then everything else is 1% of the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is largely nitrogen. It has, thank goodness, it's got some oxygen in it, right? So we can stay alive on this planet. Other things can benefit from having oxygen. 
What's missing in this chart is water vapor. Oftentimes, water vapor is downplayed significantly. Water vapor is generally varies because it condenses, forms clouds, condensation. You know, above a certain altitude, you, you find a decrease in water vapor. But generally speaking, you know, tropics, big time increase in water vapor. You go to the polar regions, and of course, it's cold and it condenses out. To put a plug back into Michael, for Michael Connolly's thing, he shows a, a chart that shows the concentration of these gas, some of these gases. Well, why is water vapor missing here? Water vapor is 4%. CO2 is 0.04%. So it's like one hundredth of the water vapor. Oh, and it's supposed to be warming the planet. Another question, Mr. Scientist. And so the whole idea is that greenhouse gases come along and they are supposed to warm the atmosphere. And the greenhouse gas is, is shown here, obviously, and it's a way to uh, keeping plants warm. And the plants are warm because the conduction of heat out of the greenhouse building is restricted by the roof and the material. But the radiation can come into this greenhouse via the transparency in the ceiling. And, and in fact, perhaps depending upon the material, the infrared radiation can escape through the roof as well. But, you know, in effect, really, it's, it's very powerful for growing greenhouse gas, gr growing plants in, in buildings. But what is, what's going on in a greenhouse gas? Okay, well, the fundamentals are that a greenhouse gas is a triatomic molecule. And this is actually a bit complicated. And I think Will Happer is, is you know, has got some incredible papers on this that are incredibly long. Let's take CO2, for instance. If you shine up the right wavelength, the very selective wavelength of infrared energy, the CO2 molecule can actually capture that infrared. And what it does basically, if you look at the O2 molecules, is it's actually wagging the doors to the car, if you will, if that's a good enough image. It's wagging it back and forth as opposed to gaining kinetic energy, which nitrogen or oxygen would. And so, you know, the capture time for the radiation is a second. The time to release with a collision near the Earth's surface can be a nanosecond. So what this says is that the CO2 molecule can capture the radiation photon, and they're generally speaking at higher and higher degrees of CO2. It doesn't increase the number of radiation photons that are captured. It's already kind of saturated. The idea is that before you can get rid of that particular photon energy, the N2 and O2 uh, street gang comes along and it takes it away from you. And so, and then it turns that into kinetic energy. So this boiling pot of energy exchange near the Earth's surface. And again, I want to refer people to Michael Connolly's what's happening near the near surface versus what's happening up in the a little higher atmosphere, you know, because there's total chaos near the Earth's surface. I mean, you, you saw that in the initial slide with the cloud, but the point is that, you know, the collisions take away the energy away from the, um, and they provide energy to the CO2 molecule. And the CO2 molecule rises as a result into the atmosphere and it loses energy kinetically and radiation wise as to the other molecules that can radiate. So, you know, there is an impact on the temperature, but it's not as significant. Some people actually have written that the CO2 captures infrared energy and stores it. And this is the slide that says, no, it doesn't. So let's move into spectra. The vertical intensity is watts per square meter. So this is effectively, if you have a, a square surface, you could measure the number of watts passing through that in some period of time. The inverse of the wave number is, is effectively, in this case, it's uh, the inversion of centimeters. It's taking the wavelength of the light and it's inverting it. And so it's just, and it's confusing for some people They want to, Make sure they understand that. Check the axes along the bottom, and you'll see that even in some of my charts, you'll see the wavelength showing up, or one over the wavelength showing up. And so, what is what is showing up then is that the UV, which is very high short wavelength or high frequency, is over on the right hand side, and infrared is is basically on the left. 
And so, because it's got a long wavelength, it ends up being on the left here. And the notch in the center of the curve, and the curve, curve is displayed at various temperatures. And what I want to point out to people is that the Stefan Boltzmann physics is very well known and accepted by all scientists. So this is not a point of contention, but you'll see that, that depending upon the temperature of emission of black body radiation effectively. So if you're radiating at 300 degrees Kelvin, you would be on the top curve and that's the curve of radiation that you would expect radiating outward. That's significant. But the curve, the notch in the center shows you that the CO2 radiation that is seen in outer space. So this is actually a, 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 a measurement value measured beyond the atmosphere. So this is beyond any effect of greenhouse gas or, you know, any, any effect. It's actually in Michael Connolly's terms to borrow his, this is, this I think would be before the, the stratosphere. I may be wrong on that, but nevertheless, you know, it's out there in outer space. And so what you see there is a notch and, and the major portion of the CO2 radiation is occurring at about 230 degrees Kelvin. And so that, that you see the notch coming down and it shows that the radiation temperature is being radiated from it does, is not indicating that, you know, the, the notch in the curve is the energy that CO2 stored and gave up in some way. That would be a, a, a bad conclusion. But so we'll come back and we'll see more curves like this. So let's, let's touch on the incoming radiation. Uh, we're looking up now, and as opposed to being at the top of the atmosphere, we're looking up at the, at the atmosphere. We're seeing two different sets of curves. The yellow curve is looking up at the, from the top of the atmosphere to the sun. And so you see the yellow curve. And so it's very well behaved. You don't see any notching. If you then proceed down to your surface, you begin to see that, oh my goodness, the ozone layer is filtering out the UV. And, and people that have been familiar with the ozone layer having been dissipated by some of the pollution coming out of uh, refrigerators and such is when that falls off, we get more UV. And so we have to be more aware. What's never mentioned is that UV reforms in about nine days. It's all in how you form the headline. But, you know, then we can march from left to right and look at the green curve. And what the green curve shows is that there's some additional O2 there's definitely some H2O, and you see eventually you get out there to the CO2. But you do see some really serious uh, collection of energy in the water vapor. This is actually less complex than it looks. If we go to the curve on the left, it's a theoretical curve. It's actually a very nice paper by Will Happer, and it shows you net shortwave energy in, which is the blue curve, and the dotted red line net long wave out. And, you know, what we're seeing then is that we're actually seeing more energy out at the poles than energy in at the tropics. So, and you see that also on the right-hand side. And I promised that I'd show you the curve on the polar region, which is the bottom curve on the right. And you see that little hump above 600 and almost getting to 800. You know, that's an energy out increase. And all these are uh, what's called clear skies, you're seeing that the, the CO2 is, uh, is actually increasing the radiation out at the polar caps. And you see that also in the, in the curve on the left. So CO2 is our friend. It's, it's actually warming, or I should say cooling the polar caps. And this shows you the effect in the paper of having no CO2, which is the green, the green curve in the center of the curve. And these are, these are theoretical one-dimensional modeling which turned out to be fairly accurate. And then the important thing here is that if you look at the difference between the red curve and the black curve, the, the black curve is today's CO2 levels. And so, you know, you see a notch and kind of looks like the curve I showed initially. And the red curve is if you double the CO2, which is supposed to be the condition the IPC is applying for the end of, of the uh, century, what do you see? you see a slight, a very slight widening of the, the spectral curve. And in fact, really it looks 
saturated. If you tripled it, you'd see even less. This is an important one for people to recognize. You know, this is spectral physics is what this is all about. And it's hard to get through the first time. Study up and you'll get a lot out of this. And so energy flow, a variety of directions from the tropic band. We've seen that polar caps, energy out, needed by CO2. Uh, CO2 does display various saturation effects to radiative forcing, which is the, the you know, emission of, of infrared out. And well mixed gases and ideal gas law do play a role here. So let's talk about the four key claims that the IPCC makes. And then we'll be able to relate what I just covered to that, to, to these four claims. And these are very essential. These are the, if you take away pretty much any one of these, the IPCC has, has to go find another job. To all the people, the gazillion people who are residing in parts of the world in the foundations, they all have to, in effect, you know, go, go start a company that says we were wrong. Okay. So. The CO, the CO2 is supposed to drive the temperature. That's kind of been a familiar statement, but I want to emphasize the audience to stop and dwell on that for a second and read through each of these and digest them. There are no natural explanations for how the temperature otherwise could be changing. I think that Elon Musk, as much as he's doing some interesting things recently, that was his pitch, to why you should buy a Tesla. You know, there are temperature trends that were used to show that CO2 is the only way you can explain those, those curves. And the third item is the computer models really are highly accurate and they show extreme eating. If the data doesn't support it, then we, you know, get rid of the data. That's Trimper if he's, he's one of the experts. Man's emissions dominate CO2. You know, and I want to touch on a couple things here, the, the models and, and the carbon cycle as I whip through the rest of this presentation. This is something that came to me a while ago, within the last month, I'm looking at various people and I'm going, you know, we're seeing third graders now being indoctrinated in climate alarmism, what's called climate change now. You know, they tried out global warming and they found that that didn't work. So they've gone back to climate change. And so, you know, what is important is that we recognize that people from the age of eight to 45-ish have never seen a debate. They've never actually read an article. They only know mankind recognizes across Europe, across the world, you know, the body of experts is telling us that man is controlling the climate and it's, it's getting to dangerous levels and all these extreme weather events are due to that. And I wish I had more time because I'd show that that's not true. And even IPCC says it's not true. So if one today suggests and asks questions, you can likely be censored. And that Twitter has got that pretty well now documented. And we live in an era of intolerance by comparison to my earlier days. And I'm in my mid-70s, so I'm, I'm old fodder at this point. You know, I never imagined that we'd be at this point where we had a totalitarian guarding and enforcement of the narrative. You can actually, people are considering, you can be cut off from your bank account and your car and traveling, much like people in China are, if you object to many of the things I'm seeing in this, in this video. Merit and the chain of knowledge are, are subordinate as a science. And I think, you know, that, that has really dangerous consequences when you start talking about healthcare and, you know, knowledge and making the world a better place and understanding causal things root causes and so on and so forth and solving problems and teaching kids better. Capitalism is an enabler here of better learning. It's not the enabler of better things and gadgets. So let's go back in time. This is a 570 million, you know, years of data. And you have to get this data through, you know, various proxies. So this is, this is indicated probably carbon dating is, is part of it. You know, they're generally pretty accepted in science. I mean, they've been peer reviewed. This has been really pretty well tested, but there's something to be seen here in, in these two curves. Now you'll see the temperature is the, the more bluish curve and it goes up and it goes down. And then you see that the CO2 curve, which is the darker gray curve is generally on a downward trend. 
if we had a serious downward trend of CO2 below where we were in the, you know, earlier this last century, we could actually uh, kill plants. You know, if the plants die, which would be 180 parts per million or below, if we get below that level, then we end up killing plants and the humans die. So we pretty much exterminate the, you know, the earth and the life on earth as we know it. And so that's, that's pretty significant. And this is just much of the same, but it shows you something else that's going on here. And there's a place that this was taken. It's called Vostok. It shows you the, the, uh, kilo years before present. So zero on the bottom scale is close to current time back, you know, 400,000 years ago. So this is getting close to when man evolved on the planet. But you do see in this particular curve, temperatures in red, the forcing, which is more about CO2 is in green. So what we see is that there's a high degree of correlation between how these two curves correlate with each other. But it turns out that the temperature leads the greenhouse gas by 700 years. And that number varies. So really what we're seeing here, and I'll show other curves of this, is we're seeing that temperature drives CO2, not the vice versa. And there's been lots of data in this regard. This is not a one-off. And this is, this is one that covers CO2 on the x-axis, parts per million. We're at probably 415, 420 now. You know, we've been down as low as 290, 278. And IPCC said, if you can show me 16 years of data, that's enough time to prove my point. Now, okay, so here's some data. This is the temperature, and the scatter plot does not correlate to CO2. It has a R squared value, which is a, a figure of statistical merit of 0 0.03. You could say it correlated if that was 0 0.9 or 0 0.8, and you'd say, well, that's pretty good correlation. And you'd see it in the curve, but you don't see it here. So that that's you say, well, okay, fine. Not really correlating very well so far. Let's keep going. And so this is this is rather interesting as well. Um, these are two of Willie's curves, actually. And the curve on the left shows you uh, northern hemisphere composites. So this is land-based data. And uh, rural stations. Now, why rural stations? Well, you get away from the city heat island effect. What is a city heat? What, why heating in a city? A lot of asphalt, a lot of buildings, a lot of things that collect energy and store energy. You know, you could be near an airport. All these things affect the temperature games. And you see a lot of temperature stations that started in the countryside. And then as the city expanded, the measurement station did not move. And so you get a warming effect because of the city encroachment. And the one on the right is a different sort of curve. And this was taken and arrived at with some Chinese engineers and Chinese temperature data, along with Willie and big data analysis. And it shows you that there is a very strong correlation between solar radiation, meaning energy from the sun, measured on Earth, and the temperature. Oh, wait a minute. I was told that only CO2 could vary the temperature. Well, that's not true. So this is data to, to show you that, you know, that this actually shows better correlation than you saw in this curve. So, uh, Terry, I, I do have one quick question here. Do you have a theory as to why 1921 was so warm? I just saw a whole Tony Heller video about uh, in state after state after state, 1921 was incredibly hot. No, I don't. Work. I think that, okay. you know, I think that the typical wisdom, as you can see in this one, is that 1930s to 40s. Tony is a, a very interesting guy. He's going down that same path of, of discovery. And, you know, all the skeptics think very highly of Tony. Yes. And he puts out these things that really are very thought provoking. Quickly through the subject of sunspots. This, this is a picture of the sun, the source of our energy. And you can see a few sunspots. Well, the sunspot data goes back in time. There are people that were observing the sunspots. And the sunspot is interesting in that, you know, you think that sunspot might indicate that the sun is cooling slightly. Well, it's just the exact opposite. The, the sunspot is, you know, a large magnetic 
field disturbance. And it's actually in a simpler way of describing it. It's taking fuel away from the surroundings and burning it in a higher temperature reaction, causing a dark spot to occur, if that does make sense. And so, you know, you've, you've got, you've got variation in sunspots. So when the sunspots go down, you think, well, Terry, what you're suggesting is that maybe the energy from the sun is being decreased slightly. Well, now we get to Willie's book in, in a time called the modern minimum. And that's a, that's a time. And there's a, there's various cycles in the sun. 11 year cycle is very common where the sun, you know, has a variation in sunspots. And, and you know, if you go down in sunspots, you reduce the sun radiation. And the modern minimum was the last, well, if I'm not making a mistake, the last mini ice age. And so what Willie did with some other engineers outside the country, I might add, uh, was to go off and measure the, and play with the measured data and, and do the big data analysis and apply AI and so on and create a model because that's what you can do with big data. And what they did is they said, okay, fine, we created the model. How do we know it's good? Well, we can, we can use the model without fudging the data. We can use the model to predict the last 15 years of sunspot activity. And we know that the last 15 years we had a pause in the temperature. And so you, you get to a, a situation where, you know, uh, you have a test, you have a direct test because you know, the sunspots over the last 15 years, did I predict the sunspots accurately? And they did, and you can see this on on cirrus-science.com, um, you'll see the paper there and it's fairly complex and very rigorous. They predict the sunspots. And so they said, okay, well, let's, let's look forward and see what we get. And so they look forward and they found that there's a sunspot minimum that's not for certain it is a model. So it has to be, has to be proven, but that there is some sunspot activity that's, that is likely in the next 30 to 60 years, which could be saying to all of us, we're entering a cooling period. So watch out, you know, it could be into, you know, a lot more people dying because of the cold. So that's, that's an interesting piece of information. So, you know, we have other phenomena and I'm not going to cover this for lack of time, but you know, there's other things that are natural causes of variation. We're after all in a warming period in an, in an ice age. Why do we know we're in an ice age? We have ice on the, on the polar caps. It's a pretty simple definition. Mankind is, cannot change the orbit around the sun. So guess what? Lack of its cycles do indeed operate and they will affect us in, in the future. I'm going to be, we're all going to be long gone before this mm -hmm. happens. But it's also interesting to note that the Antarctic data, ice core data, which is where Vostok is, and that's a common place for gathering data is that uh, CO2 lacks temperature by a thousand years in this, in this particular analysis. So again, temperature drives CO2. You go through all the certain ages, ice ages, and you begin to see that, uh, the temperature in most of that time period was actually at a temperature higher than what IPCC is predicting for the end of the century. So that's kind of, you know, well, maybe not so clear yet. That's still an open question, guys. And so this, this shows you what's happening again over the last 10,000 years in what is our current interglacial. So we're in a warming period and how many times, you know, in effect, nine times where the temperature is hotter than it is today. And this is taken in Greenland. And so we can, we can obviously see why they were growing grapes in Greenland somewhere in this period of time. So climate models, let's switch into the modeling world. You start with the clouds and we talked about that already. This is, this is directly from CO2 coalition, but it's really representing a lot of knowledge, you know, to the people who are in the world of promoting climate alarmism would agree with. And so if you can see on the bottom scale, as you, where we are today, which is roughly about 420 ish parts per million by volume. And if we double it, we're out here to 800. What is the, the global warming? for each additional 50 parts per million. Well, it certainly was pretty, pretty big from 
250 to current time, but it's not nearly as much because it follows that equation, which is a logarithmic equation. So there's a saturation effect, part of what we're talking about. Uh, there is a saturation effect, and we're going to show some real data to support that. Okay, but what is a client model? Client model is a 3D representation of Earth in this atmosphere. It doesn't do a very good job with the oceans, which it really needs to, but you can quickly run out of compute power when you start thinking of these models. And they do, they run out of compute power to make it accurate. And so what we have is a, is a horizontal and vertical grid. And what the model, the computer model is doing is it's computing, you know, what's occurring at the intersection of the grid. So if you, if you take, you know, something here, I don't know if you can see my little cursor. I can see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you take the intersection, you're actually computing at the intersection of the grid and you compute and you guess as to what the intersection at each grid point, and then you verify that I guess correctly. And then you go back, this is the numerical analysis in, in a nutshell. And then you have to go back and you have to vary what, what it is that you've done in order to make that converge. So if you make a guess and it's inaccurate, well, your guess could be this, but what you end up computing could be up here. And so they don't, they didn't show convergence. So you, you know, you iterate through various iterations, computes all the grid points, keeps computing, keeps computing. Because you change a grid point, then you have to compute the other grid points over again. So it's a complex problem. Parameterizations are the way to fix some of the inaccuracies here. You know, if you can imagine a rectangle within this grid structure, if you were to position within that rectangle or that rectangular box, if you could position a function and even a database, whereby if, if you're entering that grid at the grid points, you then would check the curve fit data. I'm going to call it curve fit data. They don't call it that, but the parameterization of how this inaccuracy could be fixed by the parameterization that's inside the database that's inside the box. It looks like curve fitting to me. It looks like the biggest, you know, I can tell you what the stock market is going to be yesterday. And I can tell you very accurately because our models have predicted it very accurately. And again, parameterization. So, you know, you look at what's going on here in, in the model and you've got 15 grid boxes across the U S well, 15 grid boxes. So I'm going to really represent the Rockies and the Plains and the East Coast and the West Coast with 15 grid boxes horizontally across, across the U.S. Well, that's pretty aggressive. California is two times six grids. Mm -hmm. so there's 12 grids that represent the Sierras and Death Valley. Highest and lowest points in temperature and could be the highest and lowest points in and definitely in altitude, but in temperature as well as altitude. So what does the resolution have to do with any of this? Well, you know, if you look at a picture, you take a picture, you don't want to get a picture that looks like the one on the right. Parameterization is not going to fix that for you. Maybe Apple will tell you that they can, but you've got to start with something that resembles the data on the left. And Willie shows, how do I show uh, you know, an average plane, because the, the, the data that's being represented on the right, the model data that's artistically represented on the right is an average of a lot of different models. So what does that look like? Well, this is, you know, we don't have time to go through this, but this is different model output, um, versus observation for one particular, you know, set of data. And let's, let's go get to that data. So this is, this shows you the year on the X axis. This shows you the balloon data. And now everybody, if they see Michael's thing, they're experts on balloon data. This is, balloon data is accurate because it's a way to verify number of, da number of data points because the measurement uh, devices are calibrated before they're loaded into the balloon. The balloon goes up, you know, and so many hours later, it blows up and you've got the data. And so you've got calibrated temperature sensors. Most everything else you don't. 
And so it gives you, gives you a clue as to what's happening. Now, the green squares are the satellite data sets. And specifically, it's the UAH data, and we're going to show that quickly. You know, that particular data set agrees pretty well with the balloon. And I think that you can see that the average of 102, and you'll see those pretty much 50 of the 102 in a layer slide. But, you know, it's the average of the number. Well, the average of the number isn't doing so hot either. The data started in the late 1970s. Yes. That's when satellite data was, was gathered. And then, you know, the modeling started back then because they, you know, Jim Hansen and a variety of others, they could come up with something. They didn't have any compute power. So they used prioritization probably extremely liberally. And so you get up into our current time, 2020, and you now have a pretty sizable amount of, of compute power. But if, if I come back to, to this, what would it take to compute this accurately? And, you know, it would indicate that you have to go for a smaller grid size. You have to put in the nonlinear equations and not just, you know, kind of bulldoze it with very approximate linear equations. You wouldn't be dealing with prioritization and all its, all its error prone perfitting. And you would, you would then compute on a very time, on a very uh, short time scale. The ones you see here, I don't remember the time scale, but it's like an hour or two or something of that nature. So you'd be, you know, in the minutes or seconds. And so the compute power, we know what the compute power that does, you know, this one, we know that that takes a lot of compute power. The computers that are, you know, the servers are a big bank of servers. So this is, this is significant. But if you took all of the compute power in the world and you dedicated it to this problem, doing this thing really accurately, just as a, you know, point of fact on, um, you know, a, a test case. And you said, how long would it take to have 20 years of data accurately? The time it would take, the compute time it would take, and Chris Hasek did a, a modeling of this and made some assumptions and so on. So this is, this is his information and I, I trust his information. The time it take is to, would take would be on the order of 10 to the 20th years. I think that's a little longer than your <laughs> lifetime, John. So I don't know. Probably. That's a lot longer than my lifetime. Mm. By the way, the computer would fail in about 10 years. So, you know, look, minor problems, but you can't compute accurately. So you have to then really judge the science and make some intelligent things. You have to look for ways to bolster the meaning of the models. What's fair game to do? You wouldn't base the policy that could, that could affect the planet and could destroy the planet as we know it. So, you know, you come, you come back to this, the average is, is pretty significantly off of, uh, of observations, accurate observations in the last 20 years are off the average because really in a nutshell, it's because they assumed that CO2 had too much influence. You know, they were selling a narrative. So they, they, built the models around CO2 influence being high. And this is another way of saying the same thing, but it's a slide that really shows a lot. And I think it's very powerful. It says, how well could the 24 models simulate seasonal and annual cycles? Not just the world's average temperature, which I showed you in the last, last mm -hmm. thing, but the seasonal variation. The models are scattered all over the place and, and how the observations are completely separated from the models. So, you know, the models don't, don't represent anything accurately for how the tropics inter interact with the polar caps. Those are the seasonal variation. This is, this is something, a hotspot, which is a famous thing that people don't talk about anymore, but it basically says the model predicts a hotspot. The observations don't show that. And it's been attempted time and time again to prove the hotspot is real. It's not. And, you know, you can go into land-based measurements in the Midwest, corn belt temperatures. So you've got, you're off away from the cities here. And you can take the average of 42, uh, you know, computer models, version five, which we're on version six now, and you average them together, just like we're supposed to do. And you now have a problem. 
the observations are indicating that there's basically no increase in temperature in the Midwest. But by George, IPC thinks there should be. So let's go to a hot city and we'll prove you're right. Okay. And this is another way of, you know, one of the things I, I think people touch on is that CO2 by itself can outwarm the planet. Significantly, I should say. And the models indicate this. The models indicate that CO2 without the feedback. What is feedback? Feedback says if you increase the CO2, you heat up a little bit the Earth's surface of, to one degree centigrade by the end of the century, suppose. I think many people disagree with that. By the way, they think it's close to zero. But let's say one degree centigrade. That that increase causes increased water vapor. And since water vapor is more powerful than CO2, but there's a positive feedback element. So you increase the temperature due to CO2, feedback element brings you increase of temperature in, in on the Earth's surface by the end of the century. Well, my, my answer to that, being a double E, is hold your ho horses, fans. So if, if, if positive feedback is possible with, with H2O, why doesn't H2O heat up the planet and cause runaway temperature? All Good question. A new job. So this kind of shows the observations lower left are very small. Climate sensitivity is, is a way to show that that feedback is either operating or not. Okay, here's, here's the one promise. The different dotted lines are the different uh, models, because there are various models. They share a lot in common. Uh, the one that's closest to the observation is from Russia, and it shows the least amount of CO2 influence. So draw your own conclusion from that. But, you know, you can see that the variation in the models are bigger than the observation values. So I'll let the audience sink on that for a minute. And this, these, all these different dotted lines are different models from different parts of the world. Now, you want to know where all the money is going in climate science? you have a partial list here. It's not going to people that have good questions in the house. This is those of the end of November, UAH data, which I might add, Tom, is the only uh, one that I'm aware of, the only time, uh, climate trend that's not owned by a government agency. So there you go. People can guess as to where this is going. And there's only two satellite databases. One is called the UAH data set, which you're seeing here. And another one is called the RHS data set, which is going through a, a major cancer treatment for modi modification of its temperature. It's adjust going through an adjustment of its temperatures as we speak. This is showing you that in the last 23 years, we popped from 0.1 up and down a couple of tenths, a couple of tenths, a couple of tenths. We went through, you know, we went through a, a El Nino, El La Nina, whatever it is, year. And so we warmed up. Ocean warming occurs when you distribute warm water over the larger ocean, ocean surface. Anyway, so then you end up going to where we are today. Pretty cold year, we're, we're forecast. And we're now at 0 0.07 above where we were back in 2001. And I always say to people, if you are responsible, for putting out a hundred times the CO2 on average over the ambient CO2 in the world. If you're responsible for that, you need to stop it immediately. Do you all agree? I don't know what you're no. saying, but yeah, I can I say no. <laughs> then stop breathing. That doesn't ever seem to get the reaction it should. But you, know, you, you can see here that we're kind of, you can make a case for the idea that we're in a, in a temperature pause. Somebody asked me about the Arctic and I said, what are, the Arctic ice is, is flowing on water and you've got, you know, currents, currents, the ocean currents are very complex that affect hurricanes and they affect the, uh, Arctic ice. And, uh, and you can see how, you know, the current can start down in the tropics and end up in the Arctic region. So we got, we got a complex system here called earth, the people that uh, were to be at my first uh, use of this data that came from birth 
obviously went through time travel, so they're capable of understanding that statement. The climate model is really, we can, we kind of covered that, I think, overemphasis on CO2 resolution and formulas used. Climate's not represented accurately by their standard. They said, we've never been able to really do climates accurately. That's in their AR reports. Feedback is not happening. I'm sorry, a quick question here, Terry. Uh, you you mentioned there's like a hundred climate models on one of those graphs there. I just wanted to know did did people sit down from scratch and write one hundred different climate models, or are they sharing enormous amounts of code in between those? Well, you know, I've I've kind of asked that question, and I I don't think anybody knows for sure because you know this is sort of like Apple and product development. It's partly that if you go back to ClimateGate, many people can find in ClimateGate that there's a lot of sharing of information and a lot of calibrating between individuals who are different institutions. Okay. Yeah. And, and so I think that the answer to that question is we'll never know. Uh, but the answer is I can sell a grant based on the idea of proving the result that you want. If I vary this parameter, yes. here's, here's your check. So, you know, I think it's money driven. Okay. You get a hundred something, you can get 50. So now they want 42. I don't know how many they're validating, but people are scrambling, trying to find work and trying to justify. So let's turn to CO2 on Earth and, and get through it pretty quickly. You know, we know that as CO2 goes up, plants love it. And many people have seen both of these curves, so I probably don't have to explain. You can see the ambient in a greenhouse on the left, 385. And then in a, in a separate greenhouse, you can see as you start to increase those, you can see that the plant grows significantly. You can see the satellite data of what's changed in those 30 years. So go in and measure the trees, measure the foliage, you can do that by satellite. So this shows you that, wow, you know, we're getting 10, 20% increase. And interestingly enough, if you look at Africa, look at where the greatest greenery is. It's next to the big desert. That's pretty cool, you know? And I think that if you pull all this together and you, and you say, well, how many, we've increased the number of trees. We never accurately measure the trees until we had a satellite anyway. It was like 4X the number of trees on earth than we thought there were until we measured them. And, and so you put this together and you say, okay, the number, the area increase of greenery put to that's increased because of the increase in CO2 over the 30 years is equivalent to the continental U.S. geographic area. That's the increase in area of foliage in plants. And so we're growing plants, we're solving world hunger. Plants as well, as you increase the amount of CO2, you make the plant more efficient, as you may remember one of your earlier podcasts, you can make the plant more efficient and therefore it can operate more optimally at a higher temperature. You don't kill plants, you actually enhance the growth, you can enhance the foliage if you increase CO2. And you're not increasing the, the temperature of Earth at the same time. We can't leave carbon without talking briefly about the carbons. People do not talk about this often enough. You know, I'm a semiconductor guy. So, you know, my origin was. You know, semiconductor physics, which we, you know, we all know and love because their phones and their computers are on and the internet, et cetera. Now, a lot of stories I can say about what people predicted and how inaccurate they were, by the way, on the science of, of semiconductors. But, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating to, um, you know, to see that in semiconductors, you're always thinking about the difference between two opposing forces that are large. So if you tilt the scale, you can tilt the result and you can measure the difference. Let's look at the carbon cycle. Now the carbon cycle is the gray circular oval shaped arrows around the outside. And you know, that shows that carbon goes somewhere, spends some time in the sediment in the ocean, gets out of the sediment in the ocean and gets up into the ocean surface, you know, maybe through shale. Fracking. Yeah. So fracking gets that carbon back out again, you burn it, and 
goes back into the atmosphere, and it goes through the atmosphere, goes back into a plant, starts to cycle over again, may be absorbed in, into the ocean. Well, if you look at these numbers, and this is actually an IPCC curve, it's not new, it's not recent, they don't make a big thing of this. But one thing you quickly see is that mankind's emissions getting into the atmosphere is about 5.5 gigatons. What in a lot of curves you don't see is when they show you gigatons out, they don't say that that's at the Earth's surface or that's actually measured or verified in some way getting into the atmosphere. Because into the atmosphere is only 60% of the total emitted from the Earth's surface. So how do you know? You don't know. You can't measure it very accurately. You can estimate the number of barrels of oil burned. You can estimate what man is doing. But the rest of this, you don't have a clue. Look at in the center. You see 92 being absorbed into the ocean and 90 out. That's gigatons. So what happens if the, what happens if the um, ocean warms? Well, there's more, more CO2 that comes out of the ocean. Temperature drives CO2, right? So you get more nature-driven CO2. And you go through the plants and, you know, they're being a, making a big to-do about vegetation now, and this is all driving global warming. But you look at the number at the top, 750 gigatons of CO2. To, to bring 5.5, even if you assume that's accurate, 5.5 from human, now they're trying to get that up to 30 gigatons, mm -hmm. and they're massing all kinds of, you know, things that they're adding to that list. I don't think they can justify the accuracy of it. But suppose they can. You're getting 30 up there. How long is it going to take to increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere? It could be quite a while. So CO2 doesn't stay very long in the atmosphere. The IPCC says it's going to stay a couple hundred years. Could be a thousand because that serves their narrative. And there are various skeptic, skeptics that say it could be eight months. Could be four years. This is a case in point. You look at the carbon cycle, what's missing here? A few of those billion dollars going to do the studies to understand what the hell's happening to CO2. How long does it stay in the atmosphere? That's critical for us to understand. You know, models failed us, we don't know. We got to at least spend a few billion to understand what CO2 is doing in the atmosphere. Okay, so this, this brings us back to a summary of the spectra. So I'm gonna try to describe this in an understandable way. So this covers the entire spectrum. The red on the left is, you can see is visible UV. It's really what we showed as the incoming spectrum. So this is what we measured at the earth surface. Stuff on the right is what's going out. And that's at the top of the atmosphere. Uh, the one on the left is at the Earth's surface, the one on the top, on the right, blue, is at the top of the atmosphere. This is, um, you know, it shows you, it basically shows you in the absorption curves down below what's going on. And you can see by molecule where the carbon dioxide, but look at water vapor. It's about top of the major compound. <clears throat> it's kicking ass. You want warmth? Throw a water blanket up in the, in, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and warm it up and, and heat up water. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, you can go through this and you can find out that there are saturation effects and so on and so forth. That water vapor swamps the other greenhouse gases. And one to understand that can read the 59 page paper from, from Happer. It's, it's pretty detailed, very detailed. But this shows you that, you know, that there's a lot going on here that really has to do with, you know, water vapor is, is kick ass. But you see the water vapor absorbing all over the place. CO2 emissions, lower and left hand, you see the total U U.S. greenhouse. This is a, is a measured curve. One on the right is a measured curve. You know, you see that CO2 going up and then we installed more natural gas and the natural gas, we burn less firewood. And all the things that we did to improve the environment, we actually reduced the amount of CO2. But what I find interesting in this is you know, China, of course, has gone through the IPCC and, you know, we're one of you guys, you know, we're going to sign the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement increases, allows them to do things like this. China plus India 
is going to be, by some people's measure, two to three X in the United States. And this is an interesting curve, another representation, but with more countries involved. And this supposedly is just the estimates of the emissions. Roughly, if you were to put this on a, on a more horizontal scale, the Africa emissions is roughly constant. It's not increasing like China's is increasing. You can see China's is increasing really dramatically. Africa is sitting on untold amounts of natural gas. So it could be improving a lot of people's emissions of CO2 if that was still of significant. But the world authorities do not allow them to do that. Because to do that, um, you know, to allow them to increase, Africa has been trying to borrow money through the World Bank to establish electric fossil fuel power plants. Low cost, very, very efficient. They're, they're getting to be pretty efficient. And, you know, you could, um, if you're really worried about it, then gather, put some money together and do the carbon capture. You know, it's expensive, but do the carbon capture. And save our brothers in Africa. But no, they're not interested in helping all the citizens of Africa. They're not interested in that at all. They say, you guys have to go solar and wind. You don't have any money to do that, but that's too bad. So if you look at this, you can see that there is basically, you know, getting up into the 36 emissions of, of a billion tons emission per year. You'd say, okay, there's a lot of CO2 going into the atmosphere. So why is this curve flat, Dom? Mm. Great point. Come on here, man. You know, I, I'm a semiconductor guy. You know, I'm looking for data that's real. This doesn't look mm. real. This is measured accurate data. We saw the accuracy of the data. We understand this is accurate. But then we got a dose of computer modeling and we got a dose of, of CO2 going what to the atmosphere. I think I've heard people say that the temperature skyrocketed around 1850 to 1870 because of human CO2. But then if you show that graph that you just did, we weren't emitting very much CO2 then compared to now. Yeah, no, so it doesn't make no sense. Yeah. It's skyrocketing. When Al Gore was born, there were 7,000 of us. And today there's only 30,000 nice. that remain. And I, I wish humans would take us more seriously. Nice. Now you can ask the question, why is that the case? Well, they outlawed hunting of polar bears. And the curve on the upper right is, I think this is actually due to um, Ronan's analysis. He did some work. And what he found was, and that's, that's the Arctic region, what he interestingly found is that, you know, we're not accurately uh, depicting the data. IPCC is not accurately depicting the Arctic amount of ice coverage. And the whole idea of the ice goes way down or gets way thick, you know, the polar bears are going to suffer. You know, it's, it's uh, the sea ice in the summer, if it goes way down, oh well, my God, you know, polar bears are going to be dying by the droves, but actually it, it, it comes back up again by observation. So, you know, the observations and the, in the theory, it's, you have to, you have to prove the narrative right. You know, this is the degree that we're in in climate science. So in conclusion, CO2 does not drive temperature. Nature does. And the audience can dwell and back up through the video and say, I don't think that's the case. My, my kid told me his teacher said. Okay, so remember the teachers in general do not know what the hell they're talking about because of this attack on science for 30 years. Teachers are only good as the way in which they've been taught. And I've seen some people that, you know, talk about climate as though they're an expert. But they're, they're knowledgeable about one little silo and they forget to ask one question about what's happening in the silo. Models do not work and you can't assume that they do. You can't justify that they do. You can't say I'm, I'm an evil person because they don't. You, you've got to deal with facts sometime in your life. When you die, there is a fact. CO2 is not a pollutant, but the gas of life. It's really doing more positive for us than negative. Science is not subtle. Science is never subtle. We need to save lives. We need to keep science unsettled. There's a lot to learn. 
And I think climate history is not in favor of alarmism. Energy policies are far reaching. Net zero is the big term that's going around now. And, you know, me with some other people are looking into this. Net, net zero can be defined in a variety of ways, but it, one way is zero CO2 emissions. Is that possible? No is the answer. If we stop fossil fuels burning tomorrow, we just said no more fossil fuels. And anything that's derived from fossil fuels, we would not have hospitals open. We would not have, obviously, any transportation. That's obvious. We would not have a military that could protect us. How long would we stay as a nation? How many people would die in the, in the process? So this is, this is an absurd. And so they don't really mean net zero. They mean, I'm going to define it later as I see fit. Renewables of solar, wind, and even nuclear. But solar and wind are the ones. There's not enough landmass in the United States. There's not enough money to put battery storage into, into play here because wind and solar are not reliable. I mean, you know, Ronan's gone on and on and done that. I've been studying copious papers in this arena. The cost in, in crisis, the number of crises, this is the, this is the key point here in all of this. Uh, I'm sorry to break it to you, Greta. I know you've got enough mental challenges as it is, but the number of crises that would develop with net zero and going renewables is much greater than your crisis of using CO2 in the atmosphere and using fossil fuels to save people's lives. You would create so many crises. You would, you would have the crises that you're creating up here and the one you're trying to avoid, even with your bloated spreadsheet analysis down here. So it's not, it's a time to call them out. It's a time to say enough is enough. And that's what we're trying to do. And I think this could have, this could have an impact. People are convinced climate change is happening, but are they prepared to, to spend everything they own and every future generation to achieve net zero? I think, you know, I wanted to get to, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If you can't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Hmm. Richard Feynman, you know, I think this one is, is, is where we're kind of progressing through. And there's a reason why everybody was saying in 10 years, planet's going to grow, blow up. In 20 years, this is going to happen. The end of the century, something's going to happen, but next five years are critical. This guy, Schopenhauer, came up and other people have said something like this. All truth passes through three stages. The first one is ridicule. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not a climate scientist. Terry, you're a semi-patriot scientist. You're not a climate scientist. You're not accredited. Willie, you're not a climate scientist. And, and then you say, sit down and, and we'll compare notes, dude. Sit down and let's find out who is. It. And so the next one, violently opposed. You're going to destroy the planet. You are advocating racial disparities. You are, in the, you know, and you get this in your face. And then the third one, well, you know, we kind of thought that the temperature wasn't going to go up and the computer models were going to break. We thought that was kind of self-evident. I, you know, if anybody didn't see that, then shame on them because it has been self-evident to us for quite some time. So, you know, acknowledgements of a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people, but you know, it's, it's important for climate scientists to in effect really get in the fight. And I, I sat in a guy's, you know, I won't mention his name, but if he watches this thing, you'll know who he is. I sat in a guy's, uh, you know, living room with Willie and the Connellys and several people, Jeffrey Foss, expert in all these comments, right? And I'm challenging them. This is back, Jeffrey since passed away, but you know, it, it's, it was back probably 10 years ago now. I said, you know, we've got to get serious about this. We can't operate as nonprofit silos. We've got to have a national campaign or game over. We've got to go out there and convince people in a way that they can understand. And there's various audiences. Let's go out and analyze the audiences and talk to them and have, you know, have focus groups and get something going. And they looked at me and they said, no. Because that's, that's mm. a territory that's hard to predict. And I'm in a group of climate scientists. What we needed was to have asked that question 20 years prior where we had some money people, we had marketing people, we had people that really saw the fight for what it is and has become. No one thought that MIT would be where it is today. MIT is a disaster in the making. MIT, 
the bastion of STEM University. And I know the guy that's leading the charge for reform. He hmm. stayed in my house here not too many weeks ago, and he's going, oh, no. Too many DEI. Anyway, arrest, arrest with that. Um, you got to say, when you're up in the plane, looking down, one of the things that's happening here, one, one of the things that's happening here is water vapor rising to a high enough temperature. We all know that if we put our hand outside the plane, we'd be frozen and it would be injured. We'd have mm -hmm. frostbite. So we know that the, the temperature as you climb up into the atmosphere, it's the ideal gas law at work. You know, the water vapor will reach a point in that cooling process where it will cool sufficiently, where it will condense. Condensation is the release of energy. You get rainfall dropping, you get stuff going down, but you get energy up as well. This is a great example of the earth using water vapor to cool itself. And this is what we really have in climate science. All right. Anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? No, I think, I think it's just, it's just a question of, uh, you know, people really, um, taking Feynman seriously. If someone says that they're a bad person, they know they're not. But they have a will on the acumen in you know, to say, no, that's not correct. Don't get excited. Don't fight their game with their tools. Just say, you know what? You really should see this video. You really should study it because if you're wrong, I've said, you know, this to people, and the only thing they know how to say to me is, well, Terry, you could be wrong too. And I said, yeah. But if you're wrong, the planet's population, which is now getting close to 8 billion, it's going to be a lot less, and the people in charge are going to survive. And you and I are not, if we were to live that long. And so be careful what you subscribe to. If you're rooting for a team that always loses in football, you're rooting for a reason. You want to win, but eventually you might. In this case, we've got to win. We've got to win in science for a lot of reasons. And I think that's the point I would challenge people to do that. Look at science seriously, because it's getting attacked left and right. Climate science, it was the tip of the spear, as I said to Jay. It was the tip of the spear 30 plus years ago. You know, Willie can talk on and on. I wrote, I did a video about his, his being attacked by the New York Times. Okay. So good luck, everybody. Have a great right. Christmas. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that presentation. You had some diagrams there that I'd never seen before. So I'm going to be tweeting out some quotes and clips and diagrams uh, onto Twitter. Oh. And then I'll publish the whole thing here in the next day or two. But thank you very much. This is really good. Thank I, you, Tom. Thank I appreciate you. it. That means a lot. Means a lot. I hope and, people uh, get a lot out of it because my intent is very clean. All we'll, grant requests in. All right. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Okay. Terry. Yeah, yeah.